Good morning interweb, world builders log three. Last time we built a planetary system, this time we're gonna zoom out a little bit and we're gonna build something more on the galactic scale. We're gonna build a little stellar neighborhood for our home system. But first, as always, let's do some follow-up. I've updated the reference doc to include information from the last video, which is all here. So again, links in the description to Patreon. If you want to pick up a copy of this, it's over on Patreon. We got new artwork happening here. I am not responsible for this artwork. This artwork has been produced by an actual artist. Shout out to Vanga Van Gogh on DeviantArt. I reached out to them, asked if uh, they'd be up for me commissioning them for this series. They said yes, and I am so stupidly happy. It's not even funny. So no more of my crap artwork actual proper artwork and look how good this is look how professional and awesome this is i cannot wait for vanga van gogh to get his hands on the spec bio part of this series and i think it'll look great the reference doc will look amazing so um yeah massive thanks to vanga van gogh for coming on board folks go check them out links are in the description show them some love tell them i sent you etc next up some comments lots of feedback on the last video couple of people were unhappy with the two asteroid belts I had constructed, and I kind of have to say I agree. Shout out Daniel Bamberger here, who's an astronomer. Just tangent for a second. It's kind of awesome that there's actual professionals in comments, because like, I'm not an astronomer. I'm not a zoologist. I'm not a linguist. I am an expert in none of the things I'm going to talk about in this series. So it's awesome that there's pros knocking around. Anyways, Daniel breaks down things really nicely here. Uh, saying asteroid belts are usually controlled by a gas giant outside or inside of the asteroid belt, as in an inward orbit. So Neptune controls the Kuiper belt and Jupiter controls the asteroid belt and it's outside of the belt. You run into problems when, like in my system, you have a gas giant controlling both something inwards of it and something outwards of it. So it's a little bit unrealistic. For now, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to think about it. Maybe I might update it to just have a single asteroid belt. We'll see. But shout out Daniel again. Thanks for the feedback. Also, they're a distant cousin, apparently, of Bode from Bode's Law fame, which is just like nuts to think about. Whoever built this planet made it a small world. I agree. And finally, and most important of all, the Worldsmith has been updated. Major update this time. So this is the Worldsmith 2.0. Again, links are in the description. I've added an email address here. So if you have any bug reports, please email me. It's just that at the moment, I'm getting them in um, YouTube comments, Discord, Patreon, Twitter, and email. And it's kind of all over the shop. So if you got a bug report, send it to the email. That way, everything's in one place. And it's a little bit easier for me to deal with it. Next change is I've included a version history tab. Actually, let me make this sheet a little bit bigger. I've included a version history tab so you know what changes have been completed. The major change that I spoke about a second ago is in the galaxy sheet, which we'll be using today. So that's follow up done. Without further ado, let's head on over to the galaxy tab. Instead of doing the usual thing where I do like explanation time and then build something, I'm just gonna do explanation and building at the same time. Might flow a little bit better, we'll see. So the first thing the spreadsheet wants us to do is to work out some galactic characteristics. Namely, it wants us to work out the galactic radius, how big our galaxy is, specifically our spiral galaxy, because this spreadsheet is working on the assumption that we're dealing with a spiral galaxy. Now, the Milky Way is about 50,000 light years in radius, although I believe of late that's been updated and it's actually a little bit bigger than that. But either way, in the ballpark of 50,000 light years is about the Milky Way. In terms of an upper and lower bound here, it's kind of hard to say. I know I've seen galaxies that are quoted as being like 10,000 light years in radius. And I think the biggest one I've ever read about is a spiral galaxy that's, I think was like a quarter million light years in radius, I think. So maybe take that as a loose like upper and lower bound. 10,000 light years in radius up to like 200,000 light years in radius. I'm going to go for a relatively small galaxy, maybe less than the Milky Way. So let's do maybe, let's do maybe... 30,000 light years? A little more than half of the Milky Way. Yeah, for now anyways. So the spreadsheet then computes the galactic habitable zone. Now the galactic habitable zone is a bit of a contentious hypothesis. Lots of people think it's legit. Others think it's a load of hokum. But for us, it kind of um, 
is a good tool to have to like limit the amount of locations where a star system can be in the galaxy. And the way this works is that if you take a spiral galaxy like so, there will exist a sort of ring about half the way out from the core to about two thirds of the way out from the core. Something like that, that's like the ideal location for a star system. The reason being, you don't want to be too close to the core. The core has got like lots of densely packed stars. It's a bit messy in there, a bit violent, not great for habitability. You also don't want to be too far away from the core, right in the outskirts of the galaxy, because there's less stuff there and perhaps so little stuff that there's not enough to build a habitable star system. So about half the way out to about two thirds of the way out, is generally considered the galactic habitable zone. Now there's a few other considerations that the spreadsheet doesn't take into account because there's no need, but just FYI, you don't want your um, star system to orbit in the spiral arms. The spiral arms are like star producing factories, really violent places. Again, not great for habitability. So you want your star system just outside the spiral arms. And in order for that star system to remain outside the spiral arms, it's got to orbit on a nearly perfect circular orbit. Because if it was on a really eccentric orbit, it would dip in and out of spiral arms over geological time, and that would be no bueno. And I guess the final sailing point is that the star system should not have a very inclined orbit around the galactic core because if the inclination is too high, it'll like pop out of the plane of the galaxy, out of the galactic disk, and that's also not great. So, ideal location, a half to two thirds of the way out from the galactic core in a spiral galaxy, not in the spiral arms, on a nearly circular orbit, and on a low inclination orbit. That's basically the sort of most important considerations when it comes to habitability. But do bear in mind, like I said, it's a little bit contentious, so you can kind of work around it if you so desire. Now, in our spiral galaxy here, we see that the galactic habitable zone is between about 14,000 light years to 18,000 light years out from the core. So, we want to plot the location of our stellar neighborhood, and by extension, our star system, somewhere within that range. So, I'm going to say something like, again, it doesn't really matter. Let's say somewhere sort of in the middle. Let's say like 16,000 light years. Now next we need to input the radius of our stellar neighborhood. And what this means is that if you imagine this is our star system, the radius we select will define a region of space around our star system, a spherical region of space, whereby any stars and star systems inside said region are said to be in our home system's stellar neighborhood. Dare I give my own work credit here, I think this is a really useful tool for building like um, interstellar political entities. So like we could have like the Artifexia hegemony and it is defined as any and all star systems within a X light year radius from Artifexia are under the political influence of Artifexia. Again, upper and lower bounds here are completely arbitrary. You can make things as big or as small as you want. If you go too small, Remember, space is largely empty, so there may not be anything in your stellar neighborhood. And if you go way too big, your stellar neighborhood again might pop out of the plane of the galaxy. And given that around the solar system, our solar system, the galaxy is about a thousand light years thick, you don't, wouldn't want to have your stellar neighborhood be greater than 500 light years in radius. So yeah, no min, but we'll say radius should be less than somewhere around 500 light years. So to start off, I'm just going to say, let's say something like uh, maybe 10 light years. Say there's a 10 light year bubble around the Artifexian star system. Now next we need to input how many stars will be in that bubble of space. What is the density of the stars? The more stars per cubic light year there are, the more densely packed our stellar neighborhood would be. On average for the Milky Way, it's about 0.006 stars per cubic light year. And in the vicinity of our solar system, it's about 0.003 to 0.004 stars per cubic light year. Like super low densities, because again, space is mostly empty. So I would say again, as a range here, 0 0.00 and then some sort of number. That low. I might change this to just 0 0.004, just for the crack. And that's all the input done. The spreadsheet is going to take over completely from here. So it looks at the size of the bubble of space around Artifexia, around the home star system. 
and it looks at the density and then it populates that bubble of space with an appropriate amount of stellar types. Namely, main sequence stars, white dwarfs, brown dwarfs, giant stars, and other stellar mass objects. So we've talked about main sequence stars before. OB, a fine gung and kiss me. O stars, really massive, very rare. M stars, extremely low mass, very common. And that's borne out in the number here. So in this bubble of space, we have none of the high mass stars, one G star, one K star, and 12 M stars. White dwarfs are stellar remnants of low mass stars. So when low mass stars completely die, they leave behind a white dwarf, which is an object about the size of Earth, but has the mass comparable to a star. And there's two of them in our neighborhood. Brown dwarfs are like planet star things. They're objects that never quite became stars, but they aren't kind of planets either. They sort of blur the line in between planet and star. They're like really, 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 really massive Jupiters. Giant stars are like your, I think you have yellow giants, red giants, blue giants, I think. Uh, hyper giants, super giants. These are all stars that are in the process of dying. They're, again, incredibly violent and you don't really want to have any of them around your stellar neighborhood. It just, it, it's bad news for all the other residents of the neighborhood. And then other stellar mass objects here are things like neutron stars and black holes. And those are the dead remnants of high mass stars. So when high mass stars die, they leave behind neutron stars or black holes. So I'm looking at the spread here and I see an immediate problem. Remember the Artifexia star was an F star, right? But given the size of our stellar neighborhood and the density, there's no F star here. So there is no Artifexia in this space. So I'm gonna just gonna inc either increase the size or increase the stellar density until we get at least one F star. And then that boil, that's going to be Artifexia. So let's just try and uh, let's bump this up. Maybe 11. Boom. All right, there we go. One F star. And actually, I'm going to make it 12 just because 12 is a really nice number. There we go. One F star, two G stars, three K stars, 20 M stars. The vast majority of stars are going to be M stars. Three white dwarfs and five brown dwarfs. No giant stars. Perfect no neutron stars, black holes, what we'd expect. And that's for a total of 34 stellar mass objects in our solar neighborhood. So next up, we know that we have 34 stellar mass objects, but how are they arranged? Are they all in individual systems? Ergo, 34 systems, one object per system. Are they all in binary systems, ternary systems, etc.? Now, this is a new thing I found out in making this calculator. I found this paper, this admittedly somewhat old paper, but it does do a neat thing and gives a statistical breakdown of the various types of system. 56% of star systems, according to this one paper, are single star systems, 33% are double, 8% are triple, and then 3% are four or more star systems. And that's dope. i would never found a statistical spread before making the Worldsmith. So I implemented it here and insofar as possible, the spread tree tries to stick to the numbers from the paper. So in our case, we're looking at 10 single star systems, seven binary systems, two triple star systems, and one quadruple system. And that, that's grand. And in one of those boils, that's gonna be Artifexia for a total of 20 star systems. So 34 stellar mass objects distributed realistically into 20 star systems. Now we know how many star systems there are. The next question to ask is, where are they in that stellar neighborhood, in that bubble of space? And this is where the star system coordinate generator comes in. The spreadsheet will generate the appropriate amount of systems. So in this case, we have 20 systems. Uh, the first system is the home star system. So in my case, it's Artifexia, and it is centered at the center of the bubble of space. Its coordinates are zero, zero, zero. And the spreadsheet randomly generates a set of 3D coordinates for each of the star systems, and it makes sure that those coordinates fall inside the bubble. And then it computes the distance from each of these systems to the home system. Any cells in green here represent the closest star systems, and any cells in red represent the furthest away star systems from the home star system. Now, I don't intend for this setting to be like an interstellar sort of thing. I'm kind of more doing all this for the demo. So I don't really care uh, exactly where each of these systems are. But one thing I do care about is the closest system to my home system. That I care about. In this case, system seven. I need that to be beyond my stars, Hillsphere. 
So again, from the last time, the hill sphere is like a region of space around an object, whereby if anything orbits within that region, it'll orbit the object. It'd be pretty bad news if another star system was inside the hill sphere of the Artifexia star system. And again, as mentioned in the previous video, hill spheres for stars are like notoriously hard to compute. But I believe the Wikipedia page for solar system lists the sun's hill sphere being anywhere between one and three light years. So just to be safe and taking into account that my star is more massive than the sun, I kind of want this closest system to be at maybe at least three light years away, just to make absolutely sure. And the way I can do this is by simply clicking on any random blank cell and then just hitting backspace, for example. And the spreadsheet computes a whole new set of numbers. Now, this is important. The way Google Sheets works with random numbers is that they are dynamically updating. So anytime you do anything to the sheet or any other sheet in the WorldSmith, these numbers here, they will all change. So if I hit backspace again, they'll change again, they'll change again. If I go up here and I edit this figure, say to something else, all of these numbers will change again. So if you do find something that you really enjoy, that you really like, uh, don't touch the spreadsheet. Take a screenshot before moving on. But I'm going to use this to my advantage here. I'm just going to keep hitting backspace until I find a shortest distance that is above three light years and then we're gravy. And to help me out, so I don't need to continuously read the numbers here. I'm just going to jot in a quick formula. So I'm going to say, if this is not important at all, it's just a little aid for me. If the minimum value between in this set here, if that value is greater than three, greater than or equal to three, Dear Spreadsheet, I would like you to print, yes. There we go. Just so I can definitely know that I'm, I'm safe. And if it's not, if it's not greater than or equal to three, I just want you to leave the cell blank. All right, so that is not greater than three, so this cell here is blank. So time lapse time, I'm just gonna hit backspace for like five minutes or something and see can we get the the closest star system to Artifexia to be greater than three light years. All right, see you in a little bit. All right, that took way too long. And halfway through, I was like, wait a minute, this isn't even the easiest way of doing this. But here we are, we live with our mistakes. So our closest star system here is star system 9, 3.99 light years, definitely safe. And again, once you find something you like, don't touch the spreadsheet. Now, final thing I want to do is I want to have the ability to make artwork out of this, like to depict the stellar neighborhood. So you see the way the coordinates are formatted in a very particular way. That's not an accident. So if I go to this wonderful site called GeoGebra, or however it should be pronounced, and we go to the 3D calculator over here, we get a 3D graph. This is extremely useful for interstellar world building, I find, or interstellar mapping. Uh, before we do anything though, I just like to mess with some settings. So give me two seconds, time lapse, engaged. I'm gonna start by putting in my stellar bubble. So a little bit of maths here, just the equation for a 3D sphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to the radius of the stellar empire, which was 12 in our case, squared. I'm gonna click on the sphere, uh, just as a quality of life thing, make it gray and drop the opacity so it's barely visible, but it is still there. And with that in place, all I have to do is go back over to the world smooth and simply copy the coordinates as they are, because they're formatted correctly, and just drop them in here. Bingo. And there, that boy oh, that right there, that is artifacts yet. Let's make them Let's make them a uh, uh, green color, we'll say. No, no. Let's make them an orange color. Okay, and that's it. You just simply go to the sheet, select the next coordinate system, copy it, drop it into GeoGebra, hit return, done. Time lapse engaged.
Now, this guy is our closest star system, so I am going to drop it in and change its color to green just to highlight it. That's system J. Where is system J? There he is. Make it green. Perfect. And there we go. One stellar empire. Done. Or not empire. Neighborhood. Done. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that they seem to be very gathered around the sort of center. Um, that's a consequence of the way Google Sheets distributes random numbers. So if you're really concerned about it, you can just simply click and drag on a system and move it around in 3D space using GeoGebra. And you can get a distribution that you may like more. Again, I'm not going for an interstellar setting here, so I'm actually not that bothered. The only thing I'm worried about is making sure that no star comes within like a critical range of Artifexia. Now, some of these other stars may be too close to one another, but again, no action's going to be happening there, so I don't really care. And I can just chalk it up to like observational flaws. Like we think they're this close together, but in actuality, they're not. All that sort of jazz. I only care about Artifexia and I have good clearance around it which is nice all right so what i'm going to do is i am going to i'm going to tinker just a little bit more with this um to get the sort of like angle and pose correct take a screenshot of it and then we'll be able to bring it or van gogh van gogh would be able to bring it into uh, photoshop or whatever and make some cool artwork from this so final time lapse engaged Okay, so that was a whole thing. You saw me there create a whole bunch of duplicates. So we have our star systems go from B here to T. And I created, I duplicated all of them. So now we have B1 all the way to T1. And what I did was I took the Z coordinate of the star system. So this is our star system proper. I took the Z coordinate of it and dropped it to zero. So it's sitting exactly in the plane. And I've done that for art purposes. Like I'm envisaging drawing a nice little line down to the plane and then perhaps another line there to like locate it in 3D space. So that's purely just an art thing. So the system proper looks like this. And then all the helper points look like this. Just a little bit messy, but I think it's workable. So I'm gonna screenshot that, take it away, some art will be created, and then I'll add it to reference doc, etc. You know the drill. And that's this episode done. Next time we're gonna start building our habitable world. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you for supporting me on Patreon. Thank you for buying merch. Thank you for all your support. You all are the greatest. Until next time. Edgar Allan.